Cyborg decided to sponsor DevOps Talks this year um, because we were looking to uh, do some outreach to the DevOps community in the Melbourne area, and we heard about DevOps Talks as having a stellar reputation as the event to go to, the conference to go to for DevOps uh, in the Melbourne area. Before I start, uh, some <laughs> Thank you. prayers and offerings to the gods of the projectors and the clicker, um, and also the trolls in the crowd, so you be kind and constructive in your questions when it comes back, right? Um, and also a shout out to the crew over there who've been through a lot of stress. The gods of the machines haven't cooperated with them very much, but they have persevered, and um, I don't think they've got much sleep last night, and yeah, thank you for that. All right, so look, Ma, no servers. A lot of people, when I spoke out in the, uh, uh, over lunch and stuff, uh, told me that the title looked interesting, but they had no clue what I was going to talk about. Um, so there, usually when you propose talks to conference, it's usually you know, you've had a few beers, and you just realize that, oh my god, the see a call for papers is ending in like you know, half an hour, and I need to think of a topic. So that's where I thought of the topic. Um, so what I was thinking of when I was thinking of the topic was, Basically, if uh, look, ma, no hands is actually okay. So yeah, the gods are cooperating. So in, in, one thing that I forgot was they have a plan B. So you can go to shivaman.github.io. The presentation is there. All the slides are there, and the speaker notes, right? So you can follow that in your mobile devices if you wish to. Um, so look, ma, no hands is uh, quite an obscure term, and I was trying to find out uh, the history behind it. It seems to come from a 1940s film called White Heat. Uh, couldn't really find out, but what it stands for is to do something daring, right? Um, and at the moment, you've heard a whole bunch of serverless talks, like you know, Scott talked about it, Pete talked about it. Um, I don't think we, as a community, are at the uh, at a place where we can adopt serverless in anger, like you know, where we can write business logic, like something like what um, uh, a cloud guru was doing. I don't think we are in a place at the moment. Uh, and it's a daring thing for us to do, which is where I got the title from. The subtitle is, is a crappy one. I think I should have come up with a better one. All right, my name is Shiva. This is probably the least interesting slide. I'm a development team lead at Envato. Uh, so if you have questions or brickbats and things like that later, you can tweet me at Shiva Man. So let's first set the scene, right? Like same pageify on what we mean by serverless. So let's try for the next 40 minutes to think of serverless as a proper noun, right? Which means that we can define it to mean whatever we want. So there's been a lot of snark in uh, social media and things like that over a period of time about, hey, it's not really serverless. There are servers behind serverless. Yeah, yeah. That's like saying there are people behind software. Yeah, yeah, there are. There are people behind software. There are servers behind serverless, right? So let's try and demystify and try and define what we mean by serverless. So I have this, uh, like when people come to me with an architecture or a solution and say like, oh, this is a whole serverless thing, I kind of do a smell test of it. Um, so some of the attributes that I use to kind of define whether it is serverless or not. So what does the serverless smell test look like? You typically don't make infrastructure decisions. So you don't make decisions around what instance family do I choose? Do I use a compute optimized instance? Do I use a memory optimized instance? What size is the instance do I need? So you don't make infrastructure choices. You don't, what subnet do I need to put this in? So you typically don't make those choices. You don't make capacity choices either. Right? So do I need a load balancer to load balance between min number of instances and max number of instances? Things like that. Right? Like how many containers do I need? Do I need order scaling? You don't typically make choices like that. You typically don't make software choices either. So you don't care about what operating system is it running, what patch level it is running, and things like that. And you also typically don't pay for idle capacity. When I say that, if a user transaction is hitting your system, you spin up a compute and you satisfy the transaction, and hopefully it brings out some revenue to you. But if there are no user transactions hitting your system, you should be paying $0 for compute, because you're not computing anything. You'll still end up paying for storage, because you're storing your code, and you probably have some static assets. So you'll still pay for the storage of it, but you're not going to be paying for any compute when there are no user transactions or no revenue-bringing transactions hitting your system. Right? So you don't really pay for idle capacity. 
I really love this quote by Kelsey Hightower when he talked about serverless. So the number one feature of serverless platform is elimination of any decisions that have nothing to do with shipping software. Right? I love this quote. And note that he says, elimination of decisions that have nothing to do with shipping software. Like he doesn't talk about running servers, he doesn't talk about running services, he doesn't talk about servicing customers, he's only talking about shipping software. Right? But shipping software is not the end story. So when you ship software, your customers don't get that feature. Right? There's still some other bits that we need to do. But serverless is that, like it helps you ship software really fast and it eliminates all decisions that are not relevant to it. We talked about the serverless smell test. Um, it's not so black and white. There are always sh shades of gray, right? So over a period of time since the serverless concepts came around, um, there are several uh, shades of gray that have creeped in. And let's look at some of that. So typically when we talk about serverless, the first thing that people think of is function as a service, like Lambda or Google Cloud Functions or Azure Functions or things like that. This is basically serverless compute, right? And in the beginning stages of serverless, there were a lot of uh, discussion around the term serverless and whether it should be called a function of a service. And now there is a general agreement that serverless is bigger than function as a service. Um, and there's an interesting uh, paper that some of a few vendors who have actually come together and starting to define serverless. So there's a CNCF paper called uh, Serverless White Paper. It's uh, in the speaker notes, the links are all in references. Um, which I think Pete Sbarsky is a contributor as well. So AWS and IBM and Azure have come together to kind of define what is serverless, and it's an interesting read. Um, but when I, why do I say, like typically if I say AWS Lambda or something like that, it is pure serverless service, right? But there are some things that have crept into Lambda now, which has kind of made it not black and white, it's kind of shades of gray. For example, yesterday Pete was talking about how you can define Lambda concurrency. So you can say that I want, at any point in time, only 20 Lambda functions to run concurrently. Right? So that is a limit. So you're now suddenly starting to make capacity decisions there. Um, you can provision a Lambda function to be able to reach inside a database in your virtual private cloud to actually go in and fetch data and interact with something in a private subnet. Which means the way it works is they spin up a Elastic Network interface inside your VPC subnet and then let hook up your Lambda function to it. Now suddenly when you're spinning up a Lambda function, you're making decisions on which subnet that ENI has to be in. That's kind of like, you know, starting, some of those impurities are starting to creep into the serverless concepts, but then again, we're not zealots and we don't pray in the church of serverless, so that's all right, like, you know. <laughs> um, serverless databases, so I think Pete talked about Firebase yesterday, there's DynamoDB and things like that. So when you spin up DynamoDB, there are only two dials typically there. You have to choose the read I.O. operations per second, and you have to choose the write I.O. operations per second that you want. Now that is a capacity decision, right? So it's not, again, uh, you are making, starting to make some capacity decisions, so it's not quite black and white there. Containers. I think Scott is gonna be talking about containers next. Uh, I'll try not to uh, derail your boat already. <laughs> no, but this is a, a, a controversial topic. Right? There's this serverless mob versus this container mob. I don't think it makes sense, really. There are serverless, uh, sorry, um, um, managed container services that are like you know, EKS or Fargate or you know, Azure Container Service and GKE and things like that, where you're not managing instances, you're not managing compute, you're not managing sizing uh, decisions and things like that, but you still have to figure out what you're putting inside your container and you're responsible for it. So do I choose Alpine Linux, do I choose Ubuntu, what patches are in there, what software, what versions am I using in them, how many containers do I need, do I need to scale? So you still are making those decisions. So I consider them to be kind of a darker shade of serverless. And then you have the higher of the order past platform as a service uh, constructs like Heroku and Cloud Foundry and things like that. So with Heroku, again, you have to pick, you're writing code and shoving it over to Heroku and say that just run it for me, yep. You're still not making any of those uh, operating system decisions, but you still have to choose the size of the dyno that you need. Do I need a small, medium, large dyno? How many dynos? How much do I want to scale and things like that, right? Still a, a dark shade of serverless in my mind. And then I'm club clubbing together a whole bunch of stuff in others. Like for example, yesterday Sasha was talking about uh, you know, ML models and training ML models and things like that. So Algorithmia is a service which I consider to be a serverless machine learning training uh, service. So behind the scenes they can use AWS or Azure and I think whatnot. Um, you just give them your training model and they will run uh, compute and manage all that stuff for you and run your uh, training model and then give you back an API. So I consider that to be a serverless service. Uh, 
things like Auth0, which provide you authentication. You're still not running any servers. You're not making capacity additions. They provide you authentication. Um, Stripe or Twilio, a whole bunch of these other services that have come up, which are, again, considered serverless. What really interests me is, I think this is where the serverless thing is going, right? Like, for example, Auth0 is an authentication provider. So you can say that I want SAML or OpenID, and this is the identity provider, and give me an authentication. They have APIs and things like that. They provide you something called web tasks. So web tasks are serverless functions in the context of your Auth0 authentication event. So you don't manage servers. You can write a piece of Node.js code and throw it over to Auth0 and say that, run that piece of code for every authentication event, which means now, Every authentication event, if you say, for example, if it is SAML and you're getting a SAML response, you can write some piece of code in Node.js, which actually decodes the SAML response and does something with it, adds metadata or whatever you want with it. So I consider that to be a contextual serverless function, which you're still not running. It's provided by Auth0 and can be used in that specific context. For example, uh, the other example that I thought of was Cloudflare. They just uh, GA'd uh, Cloudflare workers. These are, again, serverless functions that they run at the edge of their network for you. Something similar to Lambda at the edge. Like, you know, uh, AWS has a service called Lambda at the edge where they run it on CloudFront on their edge pops. So um, the Cloudflare has uh, something like that as well. Twilio has functions and a whole bunch of others are starting to come with these very context-sensitive, uh, specific serverless functions, which allows you to kind of modify their platform to suit your needs. And I think that is where it is going, and it's getting really interesting. Despite all this, we need to care, right? Like, you know, uh, Scott talked about no ops and no dev and all that stuff, right? Like, we need people who care about things. Like, we can write a piece of code and throw it over to the serverless platform and it takes care of everything for you, but you still need to care about your customers. And I feel that it is the things that we care about that define us, right? Like, say, that is what, like, the radius of the care factor that we have and the things that we care about are what put us in our roles. We have opinions, and we care about the factors on which we have strong opinions. So if you are a QA, or a dev, or a DevOps engineer, or a product manager, you're there because those are the things that you care about, right? And I'll come and revisit the an I care uh, aspect of it as we go along. But a word of warning, right? So a lot of people come and start implementing the serverless hammer against things that they should not be. A lot of times, what happens is the, thing, the tools kind of take over the things that we care about. It's not about the tools. And I think it should be, uh, we should be working backwards from the customer. The customers should be our pole star, and then we should work backwards, and we should figure out what are the quality attributes that we are optimizing for. And that should determine our choice of tools. For example, when Pete was talking about A Cloud Guru yesterday, at very early stage, they decided that going all serverless, they did not want to manage any servers. So going all in serverless was what they were optimizing for. And they truly believed that that's what was going to add value to their customers. So I'm quite certain that they wielded this hammer quite heavily. And I'm sure they've done hacks around AWS services just to keep servers, uh, just to make them serverless, right? Like early days, Lambdas or DynamoDB did not have so many features. And I'm sure they have done hacks and workarounds these platforms just so they could keep them serverless. That is fine, but as long as you realize that's what you're optimizing for. And that's what's adding value to your customers. Let's get into uh, some of the architectures for a bit, right? Um, and I think Pete covered this a bit yesterday, and I think there is uh, value in reiterating some of those things. So, and again, I'm going to concentrate a bit more on compute side of things, though all the icons in there are serverless uh, services from AWS. So events. So you can subscribe your compute functions to certain events. So the services that are shown there are simple notification service where you receive a notification or an S3 event. So you put an object into S3 or delete an object from S3 and generates an event. And that can be subscribed to a Lambda function. So when that event happens, the Lambda function runs, and it executes a piece of code to do whatever. Now, that is an asynchronous invocation. The next one is a stream. So you've got a pipe, and there are a stream of events going through it, logs or IoT sensor data, or whatever it is. Right? Like you've got a stream going through it. And you can subscribe a Lambda function to that stream to actually process the events in that stream. That is, again, an asynchronous invocation. 
And the third is typically where most people dip their toe into the water with. These are synchronous indications. You have written a lambda function, which probably is querying a data store or whatever. You put API gateway in front of it. You suddenly have a very rich API, uh, which can scale, which doesn't cost much, and you don't have to manage anything. Right? Typically, that is where most people enter into serverless, and typically, that is where most people have bad experiences with serverless as well. And we'll go into some of those things as well. So let's talk about the asynchronous workflows first, because in my mind, serverless is quite a no-brainer when it comes to asynchronous workflows. The, if you're wondering what that is, that's a ripple counter. Um, what it is, is you will see that there's a clock signal going to that first flip-flop. Those rectangles are flip-flops. They turn on and off. Uh, so there's a clock signal going to that first flip-flop, which turns on. And then that fact that it turns on, that signal is sent to the next flip-flop. So it, that turns on after some time, and there's a ripple cascading effect. What that's trying to deploy, uh, imply is basically it's an abstraction of how these asynchronous workflows work. So talking about events, right? Like, so you've got SNS or an S3 uh, you know, event which is happening, and you have triggered a Lambda function. And now you want to trigger a workflow since that event has happened. Um, again, like, I'll try to reach back to uh, the examples that Pete was giving uh, yesterday. So he wanted to transcode videos. His instructors were uploading stuff into S3, which generated an event. And that basically triggered a workflow to go and decode that video into various formats, put it in S3 bucket, and a whole bunch of actions. So that entire workflow is asynchronous. Um, and Lambda functions are awesome, uh, and, and serverless concepts are really awesome for asynchronous things. Similarly, uh, Kinesis streams. So you've got a bunch of events coming through, log events or metric data, and you subscribe Lambda functions to it. Sounds very similar to events, but there are certain differences that you kind of need to understand. With events like SNS and S3, every event triggers a Lambda function. So if you've got 10 events that are sent through SNS at the same time, you have 10 Lambda functions spinning up. Right? If you've got 1,000 events, you've got 1,000 Lambda functions spinning up. Now, with streams, it works slightly differently. With Kinesis, you have shards. So these are kind of small sluices of data within your big pipe. And each shard has a Lambda function. So if in a shard, you've got a series of events happening, there's only one Lambda function that is processing all this in that particular shard. If there are two shards, then you have two Lambda functions subscribed, uh, two instances of the same Lambda functions running, processing events from those two shards. It's a subtle difference, but it, it, it matters. One of the key things that people talk about when they're talking about serverless compute is the cold start time. In the past, how have we done this? We've done this by having a process on a container or an EC2 instance or some kind of compute, listening to the, for these events and listening for these streams all the time. Whether there are events or not, we are always listening, always on. And as soon as these events come in, we are already primed, and you can immediately process the event. Whereas in the serverless world, when these events come, there's nothing listening. It's the platform that is actually taking care of the listening and the invocation. When that event happens or there's an event in the stream, the Lambda function has to start, right? Like it has to be primed up. And that is called, a before it started, the time from when the Lambda function starts to the lime, uh, time when it can start processing the event is called cold start. So it has to create that runtime environment, push your code into it, download whatever libraries you are using there, and then it can start processing the event, which might be a few hundred milliseconds depending on your architecture. So in your architecture and depending on your implementation, can you deal with cold starts? That's the key thing. If you've got SNS kind of events, right? Like you've got one event coming, you've got a Lambda function that spins up, processes that event. Immediately after that, if another event comes up, your Lambda function is already warm. It is primed and AWS will hold it around for some time. And it can immediately start processing the event. So that is, the second event might get processed in like a few milliseconds, a single digit number of milliseconds, but the first event might take like 200 milliseconds because it, because it had to prime. So now, if you've got 10 events happening at the same time, 10 Lambda functions have to come. So all 10 of them, you're going to start to pay the cold, uh, cold start tax. Right? It works slightly differently when you're talking about streams. Because there is a single Lambda function invocation for, which is processing all the events in the stream. Typically, if you have regular events in the stream, your function is already warm. Right? If you've got multiple shards, and, the, uh, and if you haven't sharded properly, if one of the shard is running hot and the other one is not so hot, then you'll start paying cold start taxes in the shard that is not running hot. 
Where does this cause problems? Because now you're suddenly having jitter. There are some events that are processed in nine milliseconds, and there are some events that are getting processed in about 200, 300 milliseconds. Can your system deal with that, right? So those are some of the considerations that you have to give when you're adopting asynchronous workflows. Typically, cold starts don't matter in asynchronous workflows because of the nature that they are asynchronous. Nobody's waiting on the other side for a response, right? So I think serverless patterns are a complete no-brainer for asynchronous workflows. But please don't do this. If you didn't know what Rube Goldberg architectures are, what Rube Goldbergs, Rube, Go Rube Goldberg machines are basically very complicated machines which have so many handoffs to do something very, very simple. Right? So do not create lambda Frankensteins like this, L really. So you've got, you're calling a lambda function from a lambda function to a lambda function. The calling lambda function dies because it has timed out. Now the called lambda function has nowhere to send it a result. If that fails, nobody knows about it. Right? Like, don't do this. Instead, create beautiful state machines. So AWS step function, I think Azure has one of these as well now, which are coordination functions. So you really need somebody to coordinate and orchestrate all these serverless functions, right? So step, uh, step functions, what it does is it allows you to model state machines and use Lambda functions, or you can use EC2s or containers or whatever it is to run those steps. What step functions manages for you is it manages handling of state and data, input data and output data between these states. It manages that state for you. It will automatically manage retries. It will manage exponential backoffs. It will manage error handling for you. So now, if you, if you ever have to string together a whole bunch of Lambda functions, definitely consider step functions. Let's talk about the synchronous invocation. So like I said, when, when you synchronously invoke a Lambda, they, there is a cold start. Typically, if you've got a Lambda function, which is, and you put API gateway in front of it, and you're using it for some kind of API, typically on the other end, there is a user waiting for a response or another service that's calling your API waiting for a response. Somebody's waiting for a response. Typically, what happens when you call an API is you go, uh, the API gateway has to authenticate you. So it probably calls a custom authorizer or something of that sort, which might be another Lambda function, to authenticate you. That takes a few milliseconds. Come back and then passes it on to your Lambda function, which for the first time has to cold start, which might be a few hundred milliseconds, depending on your architecture, um, comes up. And then it might actually make external API calls. It might reach into your data store, and it might take a few tens or hundreds of milliseconds to execute, and then return the response to your user or other service. Is that a good customer experience? Like, I'm not saying that you should not do this, but you should consider that before choosing to do synchronous APIs. Now, if, you're reaching, if your Lambda function is reaching inside uh, your VPC to talk to a database, then your cold start goes uh, higher because you have to spin up the ENI. Can your use case deal with that kind of delay? Right? And can you deal with the jitter that comes behind it? Because you're going to be, you have no control over whether you're hitting warm functions or cold functions. Right? Uh, so definitely consider that before you use serverless functions for synchronous API calls. I'm not saying don't do it, but consider that. If you are really, really, really want to do synchronous APIs, make it async. Right? Do something like this. So you've got a, a other service or user coming and asking you to, your API to do something. You return a 202 and start off a worker thread, a worker lambda function, to actually do the work, and then have the your uh, you know interfacing service or your user check back for results and then hand the results back to them. Like we had an experience uh, recently at Envato, like we didn't have we didn't have a user waiting for the response. It was mostly a, a fire and forget. So we were ingesting a large volume of logs from Heroku into our Elk stack in AWS. And Heroku drains work in such a way that you give it a HTTP endpoint and it will keep sending logs to you. And we were having a lot of trouble with that because we would receive a log event and then trigger a Lambda function and we would go through a series of steps which said, is this a valid application that belongs to Envato? Yeah. Does it, is it really coming from Heroku? Yeah. So those required Heroku API calls. And then we would write that into Firehose, Kinesis Firehose, so that it can be persisted in S3. Then we would write the same event, log event, to Kinesis streams so that it, we can be indexed and pushed into our Elasticsearch cluster. And then we will return 200 OK to Heroku. Right? And we were having a lot of problems, and we didn't even have an idea of how many logs we were dropping. 
Heroku doesn't have a buffer. It has a buffer of like 1,500 lines or something like that. We were dropping logs left and right. We kind of made it async, and now what we do is, as soon as we get a log event, we immediately push it into a Kinesis Firehose, and then return OK to Heroku. Once we push it into Kinesis Firehose, it is persisted there, right? Like on the other end, we have S3, so Firehose writes into S3, so we have the logs. We have captured the log and kept it. Now, Kinesis Firehose has data transformation, so you can spin up a Lambda function every time it receives an event where we can do the rest of the things. Or we persist it to S3 and generate S3 events, and then we do whatever we need to do. The first thing we did was we got it, put it in a persistent store, and said, yep, okay, we've got it. So we kind of made it async. And it works like we've, we're not dropping any more logs now. So consider something like this when you're designing your APIs and you want to call it synchronously. So Scott talked about this. So do we have no-code nirvana? So we have things like, so did you know that you could actually create a Lambda function and put an API gateway in front of it, you know, jump through some hoops, and actually sell that on AWS Marketplace? So you can actually monetize your APIs. You have to jump through a lot of hoops. Uh, hopefully, it'll get easier. Uh, you also have something called a serverless application repository, where there are serverless applications written by people you don't know that you can run in production. Uh, there is a service called stdlib.com, if you haven't looked at it. So there are, there's a community which is writing functions, and stdlib will run them for you. So I see a dystopian future where a business person comes and sits down and drags and drops a few of these serverless applications and creates a business process workflow. Right? Do you see that happening? I don't know. We, Scott talked about you know, AI generating code and things like that. I have my doubts on this whole no-code nirvana thing, but in the end, as I said some time back, you have to care. So it's not about drop, dragging and dropping boxes or copying code from Stack Overflow and pushing it into a Lambda function, and yep, it's all done. Not really. Do we have no ops nirvana now? So now we have copied a piece of code from Stack Overflow and we have pushed it into a Lambda function. The platform takes care of scaling and events and uh, gives you some metrics and whatnot, CloudWatch logs and whatnot. So do we have, like, do DevOps engineers have a job anymore? Like, you know, do we need to do anything at all? Let's talk about that. We still care about deployment. Somebody has to care about deployment. There's a piece of code we've copied from wherever somebody wrote that still has to be deployed into our system. So we still need to care about deployments. Somebody needs to care about deployments. What are some factors there? So in the serverless world, there's a tool sprawl, right? Like we've got uh, in a serverless application model, we've got the serverless framework, Apex, Claudia, Chalice, a whole bunch of tools, which are all invariably in the end backing on to CloudFormation. And I don't agree with that, because CloudFormation in my mind is an infrastructure lens on everything. And to use that to deploy Lambda functions, I don't think is the right lens. Even though there is a lot of tools sprawl, I don't think we have got the right solution for deploying serverless functions yet. And you have to make your tool choice for what you have now. So typically what I've seen happen is the development, developee kind of people prefer serverless framework, and the opsy kind of people prefer SAM or you know, Apex, because that's more of coming from a sysadmin point of view. Uh, there is no right or wrong answer, but before you pick your tool for deployment, you have to realize what are the defaults, what are the sensible defaults. All these tools are quite opinionated in the way they do things, and you have to kind of match them up with what your sensible defaults are, make sure that they match, and then choose them. There is a function sprawl. So yesterday I was talking to Pete and asked him, like, you know, he talked, showed us some graphs about you know, how many invocations and uh, things like that. I asked him how many Lambda functions does a Cloud Guru have? They have 260 Lambda functions running across multiple regions. 260, actually, latest version Lambda function. I'm presuming that they have multiple versions of these Lambda functions, and they are managing multiple APIs and things like that. Becomes really, really hard. When you have so much code, individual pieces of code running everywhere, say every piece of your, every version, active version of your Lambda function adds to your security surface area. That's something that you have to protect and like, you know, manage, and you're paying for. So you definitely want uh, automated processes which are going across regions and garbage collecting your Lambda functions and things like that, right? Like, and you want to retire older versions very actively. So we talked about deployment tools. How, what is the path that your piece of code is going to take to getting into production? That's basically pipelines. Right? We have so many tools that we use. Uh, you know, Travis, Jenkins, BuildKite is what we use. There's code pipeline and code build, a whole bunch of tools that are there. Uh, but 
you have to look at deployments and putting it into production. Like we are quite used to it when we actually do it on EC2 or containers. They are well-defined patterns, right? Um, but with serverless, these paradigms are just coming up. It's quite immature at the moment. And you have to treat each of these, like you know, the asynchronous functions very different from the synchronous functions. Even within the asynchronous ones, you have to treat events different from streams. For example, when you are triggering Lambda functions of SNS events or S3 events, there's no persistence in those events. The nature of SNS is that it will retry three times to invoke a Lambda function. And when you are deploying, there is no way of stopping those events. So what happens if, if you are running at a really large scale, what happens when that Lambda flips and you are deploying a new version of the Lambda function? How many events are you going to lose? Typically what you want to do is you want to de uh, deploy a Lambda function. You have two uh, levers like versions and aliases. So you would probably have an alias called production, which is listening to the, which is processing these events. You will deploy a new version of the Lambda function and flip your production alias over to the new one. So you have to make sure that when that flip happens, when that flip happens, there's gonna be a cold start. In that period, if you're losing events, they're lost. So you have to have out-of-band mechanisms when you're dealing with events to figure out where you're losing logs, right? Let's talk about streams. Streams are a little bit more easier because there is persistence in streams. So the events coming into your Kinesis stream or DynamoDB streams are persisted for 14 days. So you're not gonna lose them. So there, you can actually do canary deployments, potentially do canary deployments or blue-green. With events, you're stuck with blue-green, right? Like you can't do canary deployments. With streams, there is a possibility that you can sluice off a small portion of this Kinesis stream and try and uh, hook it up to your new Lambda version to process, potentially. But you have to work it out. Like it's not an inbuilt into the, it's not a feature inbuilt into the platform. You'll have to write some glue code to pull out a percentage of your events and push it into a new Kinesis streams. You have to have item potency when you're processing those events, all those things. But it is possible if you really need it. But otherwise, blue-green. Again, push, uh, you know, flip your alias to production and then your streams, uh, the events in your streams will be started processing by the new version of your uh, Lambda function. With synchronous API calls behind API Gateway, you have a lot more control. So now you can suddenly start sending, you can use Route 53 or whatever it is to send 5% of your traffic over to a new version of your API and then slowly cut over. Or if you wish to do so, you can just do blue-greens. So you have to make all those decisions. Irrespective of how you are deploying it, definitely use pipelines to, and, uh, to create these workflows. Now, uh, tests, right? So I haven't talked too much about tests because it's hard to test. Uh, serverless functions running in Lambda, it's getting better. Uh, I think I just saw uh, a new release from AWS saying Cloud9 can now actually debug Python, five, Python Lambda functions directly uh, in the runtime and whatnot. Um, tests are hard. SAM, the serverless application model, has come leaps and bounds. There is a SAM local, so you can actually locally test it. Uh, you can write mocks and mock all the API calls and unit test it. I think Atlassian has got a local stack. I haven't really played with it, which actually mocks a whole bunch of AWS services. Incorporate whatever your testing methodology, incorporate that in your pipelines before you deploy. Shared code and shared infrastructure. So talk about a CRUD application, right? Like you've got create, read, update, delete of a database record. Would you write the whole CRUD application in one Lambda function? Yeah, you could, but then, each of those operations, the create, you're probably uh, deleting much less than reading. So they have the, each of those operations have different scaling requirements. So you probably want to scale read a lot more than scale delete, right? So then maybe each of those operations should be different lambda function. So a uh, function for create, read, update, and delete. Now you suddenly have to share code between them, right? So, and duplicating code is not a really good idea. So when you change stuff, you have to change everywhere. So how do you deal with that? There are two ways to deal with it. You can write a shared library, like you know, and, and in a private NPM module or something like that, and import that in all these things. Or if it, if it works out, like not in this example, but there are other uh, examples where you might want to create a shared service. So you might actually create a shared serverless service, which the rest of your services are actually calling, so that you're not duplicating code. But then if you're creating a shared service, you have another API hop. You have to hop over the network to that service to you know, uh, utilize it. There are pros and cons for both. If you're using shared libraries, you don't really control much. Like if you have a new version of your library, you can distribute the library, but the users control when they're gonna use it. Suddenly you'll find yourself managing a bunch of versions of your shared library. 
Whereas if you're using a shared service, so you can run your service, you can say like, you know, you can deprecate older versions of your API and then you have control over making, making sure that people move on to the new thing. So consider, cons uh, definitely do not duplicate code, but consider uh, what are the options available to you to uh, share code. Someone has to care about security, right? Around Christmas last year, there were rumors of this crazy vulnerabilities coming up, uh, and then the embargo was supposed to be lifted on Jan 9th. Uh, but there was so much speculation that uh, the embargo was broken by Google and Amazon and, a whole, and a Microsoft as well, I think, and a whole bunch of companies, and they released on Jan 3rd the Processor Speculative Execution Research Disclosure, uh, otherwise known as Meltdown and Spectre, right? So, which pretty much meant most of the servers around the world had to be patched. Like, pretty much most of the servers had to be patched. Jan 3rd was when this was disclosed, and that's a tweet from Ajay Nair. Ajay Nair is the product manager for Lambda uh, on Jan 3rd, saying that all underlying instances for Lambdas were patched for Meltdown and Spectre. Obviously, there are more and more patches coming along, but that's not your problem anymore. Lambda takes care of patching it for you, right? I'm pretty sure A Cloud Guru did not lose any sleep over Meltdown and Spectre. Like we spent, we're still spending time, like we spent at least two solid weeks and continuing to spend time uh, fixing, patching all our services and rotating all our keys and things like that. So the platform does take care of a whole bunch of security problems or headaches for you, but there is still, your, uh, some of it is still your responsibility. So the platform takes care of that security and we all write perfectly secure code so we don't have to worry about it. Uh, mm -hmm. But then, we do all those includes and requires and things like that, which are importing code written by people you don't know from NPM and like, you know, gem servers and whatnot, right? So vulnerabilities in that are still your responsibilities. When you're deploying Lambda functions, you're deploying zip files, and what you put inside that zip is still your responsibility. Somebody has to care about it. Uh, so GitHub recently uh, uh, released uh, automatic security scanning for public repositories. You can opt in for private repositories as well. And I think they just support RubyGems and Node NPM modules. Um, I think backended, uh, there are other tools like SNYK, uh, S-N-Y-K. I think, again, the link is there somewhere, and that's a screenshot from SNYK, which, which you can, so SNYK basically has an API, and you can use the API to actually scan your libraries or it, uh, it can actually reach into your GitHub repositories to scan your libraries, or it has native integrations into Lambda. So you can deploy your Lambda function and it will continuously scan your uh, Lambda function for vulnerabilities in the libraries. So definitely uh, consider using something of that sort. Secrets, so you have to share secrets with your Lambda functions. Secrets, config variables, all same. So you have to share secrets with your Lambda functions. Uh, Lambda support uh, environment variables, which are encrypted by KMS keys. So that is one way of sharing a secret with Lambda function. But what if many functions have to share the same secret, right? Uh, what if uh, you want to have access control on those secrets? The person who is allowed to deploy, or the role that is allowed to deploy that Lambda function should not be able to see that secret, right? The other thing. What if you want to rotate, typically what do you use for your secrets? API key, token keys and things like that, right? Like what do you want to do when you rotate your secrets? If you're using it as an environment variable, you have to redeploy a Lambda function if you want to rotate a secret. Not the best idea. So use something like an SSS, SSM parameter store or things like Vault and things like that. Uh, Vault or console to store your secrets. Vault and console, you still have to run your servers. AWS has this SSM parameter store which you can encrypt with a KMS key in your control or config variables as well, right? So then, your application, your Lambda function can start, reach out into your SSM parameter store and get your secrets, which means there is an ad additional network call and API call, right? So uh, every time there's a call start, you will have that extra time that you'll have to spend to make that API call and get those secrets. But there are ways around it as well. So Lambdas have something called global context. So in your function, you can create a global context for your configuration uh, variables and secrets, uh, make the API call, uh, get those secrets, now, once it is in the global context, as long as that container or the Lambda function is warm, those global contexts will be available to you. You don't need to go back to your API, uh, SSM parameter store to get it. But when there is a cold start and your new iteration of your function comes up, it will again go back to the parameter store and get it. You have to be able to handle that jitter. IAM uh, boundaries. So typically, for example, let's take the CRUD example I said, right? So create, read, update, delete. Each of them require different permissions for, uh, against your database to do their operation. If you've written four functions for your CRUD, 
and you've given an entire IAM, your you know, uh, boundary around them is an entire IAM role, that's not really great. Because if somebody compromises your create uh, IAM, uh, sorry, uh, Lambda function, they can actually go and delete stuff as well. So you, wa you, you want to ring fence your Lambda functions to the least required privileges. There are other complications now. So if I have versions, multiple versions of the Lambda functions in production serving two versions of my API, and each of them need different IAM roles, I don't think it is possible at the moment. So you'll have to create a completely new Lambda function. So there's still some work to do there. Platform scales, right? Like, so we don't need to care about DOS attacks. You still need to because there are limits. There are soft limits and there are hard limits. The platform will scale to some uh, level, but then you might have exhaust your resources behind the scene. Your DynamoDB I, uh, read IOPS might be exhausted. Or people might inject some events in your streams, which is going to rack up a bill for you, right? So you need to still worry about DOS attacks. You can, I'm out of time, so I'm going to do 2x speed. Um, I care about observability. In the past, when we had Nginx and like, you know, Tomcat and a database, it was easy to log into the servers, look at the logs, and figure out what was going on. Now you have 260 Lambda functions. How are you going to get some observability into your system? Uh, there are people like Charity Majors and Cindy Sridharan who do a much better job at explaining observability. The links are in the references. If you haven't heard, come across the term. I encourage you to read some of their blogs. Um, Twitter talks about four pillars of uh, observability, logs, monitoring, alerting, and visualization, and distributed system tracing. Typically, at the moment, what we do is we use the different tools for each of these. We want, uh, when it, when you, you want a holistic view of it. So I look at it as uh, an X-ray that we take. Where's the skeleton when we need props? Um, so we're talking about X-rays, right? Like you take X-ray of different parts and then kind of try and figure out what the bigger problem is, as opposed to uh, an MRI scan. So you inject a tracer die and take an MRI scan, and you get a much holistic view of how it is flowing through the system and where the problems might be. So observability is like an MRI thing. That's not clear what is happening. On the left-hand side, you have a bunch of logs that are pretty much unusable. They have no structure. And on the right-hand side, you have a log with some structure that you can actually use. So please do not use console.log in Lambda function, right? Use a logging framework to produce structured logs. Logs are not meant to be human readable anymore. We are past that scale. Logs are meant to be machine readable, right? So write JSON, XML, whatever is your format of choice, write structured logs. Um, not uh, you know, uh, pushing vendors on you uh, by any means, but I thought Datadog had an interesting stance. Like they've released an APM product and they've released a logs product. It's very new, I haven't tried them out, so I'm not recommending them. We use them for metrics, they're awesome for metrics. The picture that they're painting is, you get alerted by a page duty call, you go onto Lambda, uh, Datadog and figure out which alarm breached its threshold, and then from there you can click through and look at the logs for that relevant period, and then click through and look at the APM uh, tracing and exceptions for it. That is quite powerful, right? Like in one, in, in one tool you can go through all of that. If they can get it right, it'd be awesome. There are also other tools like Honeycomb IO, which is run by Charity Majors, uh, which, which take a different take on the whole observability things I encourage you to check out. Uh, that's a diagram of an uh, open source tool from Netflix called Visceral. So they've done Visceral and Hystrix and things like that, which take the whole observability game into a whole new level. But how many of us are at Netflix scale? I don't know. Uh, if you are, consider looking at those open source tools. So. Towards the end, we have to put the DevOps back together. All these people who care about someone who needs to care about something, I look at them as DevOps engineers, or whatever name you want to call them. We need to care about our customers. We need to care about how their experience is. And so we need to put DevOps back together. I haven't talked about any new concepts. It's all pretty much uh, what we have always been doing with servers and things like that we've always known about. But those tools and mindsets need to kind of shift to the serverless model, uh, mental model. Last. This is my philosophy. I kind of look at something serverless first, but it's a loosely held strong opinion. I don't try to hack the platform to kind of make it bend to do what I need. I do that for fun and learning, but I don't want to run that in production. Um, if it doesn't make sense, um, running a well-architected container system or an EC2 system makes much more sense. So go with it, but consider serverless first. Uh, those are some references you can look at, and thank you.